Hello, hello. Welcome back to Signum Academy. This is Wesley Schantz. This is our second discussion of the light, or sorry, that's the next time, uh, the sword and the circle. So we've been thinking about Rosemary Sutcliffe, her Beowulf retelling, and now her King Arthur stories, beginning with the sword in the circle. If there's anybody out there watching live and you've had a chance to read this, feel free at any time to ask questions or put your comments in the chat on uh, Twitch. I'll try to check that from time to time. Um, but if there's anybody watching this later, you can always find us at signumuniversity.org slash academy uh, the Learn Everywhere program you'll see there and then if you scroll down the various clubs and our Twitch schedule there uh, so get in touch with us we'd love to hear from you um, pretty exciting stuff I did reread a bit of the Sword in the Circle for our discussion today. I uh, wanted to pick up again with something that Rosemary Sutcliffe says in her author's note here. Um, two things I should like to explain. This is how she concludes the note at the start. The first, that in medieval times, dinner was at about 10 o'clock in the morning typo there, and supper at about six o'clock in the evening. The second, that a tilt or joust was a trial of strength and skill between two knights at a time, a form of sport, though a dangerous one, while a tournament was a kind of sham battle between any number of knights, which often got out of hand and ended in a lot of people being killed. So I like this for a few different reasons. Um, for one thing, it's a joke of history, cer certainly not intentional on her part, that um, medieval times becomes a like a restaurant. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a medieval times, but um, she's talking about dinner and supper, and I couldn't help but think of this wonderful innovation that we have, uh, this restaurant named Medieval Times. I've never been there myself. Um, but the second thing, this distinction between a joust and a tournament uh, was really helpful for me. This is something I never had too clear of an idea about. Um, and maybe it's just the way it is that um, sports and games and jokes and things like that are some of the hardest things to uh, understand when you're going from the culture you're used to to a different culture in time or space, right? So we can usually we think of other cultures as being in other countries or other places around the world. Uh, but I think it's just as important that cultures change over time. And so when we go back to medieval times, we're really going back to another culture, one that has its own forms of games and sports, which look very strange to us today, very hard for us to understand in some ways. Yeah, so any takers on that, uh, either of those two things, um, that's mostly just for fun. Um, but it does turn out that this business of jousting and tournaments uh, is a lot of what we see happen in terms of the action of this book. Um, and that's much more the case if you do go on and read other versions of these stories. Um, not so much from Tolkien and Lewis, or even T.H. White, but uh, certainly in Thomas Mallory, Le Morte d'Arthur. A lot, a lot of jousting battles, tournaments, and all that good stuff. Now, um, did mention last time 
that uh, Merlin is quite an important figure in the book, uh, to the point where other translations put him on the title. Um, and I thought we should start with that, actually, looking at a passage dealing with Merlin here. So I'll try to make this a bit bigger for you all to see. I didn't type all this out. Uh, I thought we could just look at the pages in the library book here. So this is on page 14 of this edition. You'll see this discussion between Vortigern, the old king, and the boy Merlin, the meaning of what he had seen. A uh, vision of the red dragon and the white. The red dragon was Britain. The white dragon was the Saxon kind. Every night they fought out the conflict between the two. And surely the red dragon had the victory, Vortigern said. I and my realm have nothing to fear. But the white dragon was gathering his fighting power again when this new day laid sleep once more upon the boat, said Merlin. And he looked as though into a great distance, but a distance that was within himself. Three strains of power ran deep within Merlin from his mother who was of the Demity. He had the herb skills and the ancient half-lost wisdoms of the old people, the little dark people. And from the old druid, almost the last of his kind, who had taken and reared him and trained him after his mother entered her nunnery, he had star knowledge and the skills of shape-shifting and art magic. And both these he could use at will. But from his father, he had the power to look into the future as other men look into the past. And this came not at his own will, but at the will of the power itself, that was like a great wind that snatched him up into some place where past and future were one. So now he began to shake like a young aspen tree in the wind, and he began to prophesy in a high, clear voice many things concerning the red dragon and the white. So I think that's just an awesome bit of backstory for Merlin, and... Um, if you do read other versions of the story, you'll get very different takes of Merlin. For all that we get a lot of jousting and battles and tournaments in Le Mort d'Arthur by Thomas Mallory, Merlin remains a very mysterious figure in that classic version of the story. And I don't know enough about some of these other old places that she, Rosemary Sutcliffe, is getting her ideas from. I don't know if she's taking this from somewhere. It definitely has the feel of old fairy tales and folklore and myths and legends. Um, but she's also got this interest in history. And so when she talks about the British and the Saxons, and she talks about these different strains of power, these are at least partly dealing with historical records where there's sort of layers of history that we're working with. And this is a period in the history of England, Great Britain, when there's a transition from one layer of history to another. And so it seems like Merlin is representing that in a way here. And the interesting thing about Merlin, of course, is that he's a mixture of these different peoples. The Demetii, the half-lost wisdoms of the old people, the little dark people. So people even older than the Druids, but then he's got the knowledge of the Druids from his foster father and star knowledge, skills of shape-shifting and art magic. So what these are exactly, I'm not sure. We do see a bit of shape-shifting take place here, um, and that's quite important. Because that's how we get Arthur. Um, art magic, I don't think is a pun on Arthur's name. Um, although, I like the thought. Um, I think he's talking sort of about spectacular magic. The kind of uh, fireworks and so forth that Gandalf is famous for. Um, and these are the kind of magic, along with his herb skills. Things he can use when he wants to, at will. But then there's this other kind of magic from his father. 
And in lots of versions of the story, Merlin's father is demonic, angelic. It's unclear. Um, some people who don't like Merlin very much say his father is the devil himself. Um, but it is important, kind of strange, that this power has its own will. And Merlin is not in charge of when he will see the future the way other men see the past. Um, so it's kind of maybe like a dream, right? The way in, in dreams we're not fully in control, um, but we do see past memories sometimes and things like that. Um, but this is happening while he's wide awake. It's like a wind that passes through him. Thinking again of the wind in the door, and I looked for that phrase in Rosemary Sutcliffe's retelling. I don't think it appears. It's, of course, the title of the Madeline Langle book, um, and it does appear in the Thomas Mallory, uh, Mort Arthur. Um, but we do have that wind image here, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, it's something that uh, he becomes kind of the, the filter, right? But the power is beyond him. It, it's using him. It's using his voice. So the long and short of it is um, Merlin is mysterious. His power is old and greater than, him, uh, than himself. Um, and he's a kind of servant of it. Um, now, Vortigern, we can see, is not a great leader. Um, and maybe it's not his fault. Again, this is something that apparently is written in fate. And Merlin is merely telling him about it. Um, but Ambrose is not perfect either. So um, the ultimate good and evil of what Merlin is up to, I think remains a little bit mysterious. Um, and we hear more about good and evil when we're talking about the Lady of the Lake as well. Um, what Merlin seems interested in, though, is in what must happen, um, happening in a way that is going to make, uh, make history work. And the greatness of this time in history is something that's going to be remembered down in the ages. Um, that seems to be his great concern. So Merlin is kind of our guide uh, through the first part of this book. Um, and then he passes on the torch. Um, of course, to Arthur, but also to the Lady of the Lake. Again, so she's quite important, quite central in a couple of the other uh, versions of this story. Um, I think uh, we should start, though, with Arthur himself. So before we get to all of that, let's go up to page 27. Where we learn about Arthur. Um, so this is at the tournament where they are uh, running late. Kay has lost his sword. Uh, Kay. And Arthur, as his squire, is sent back to grab it. Now it's locked. Everyone's at the tournament. And he says, Oh, how am I to get a sword for him in this strange city? As if in answer, there came clearly into his mind the picture of a sword he had seen earlier that morning, standing upright in a stone in the garth of a great abbey church close by. I wonder what it's there for, if it lifts out of the stone, he thought. He found he was already urging his cob that way. Great old English words here, the garth, the cob. For the strange thing was that in the moment that he thought of the sword and the stone, he forgot its meaning and why the tournament had been called. Maybe that had something to do with the passing beggarman whose strange golden eyes had met his for an instant as he turned his cob from the locked door of the inn, for assuredly if he had not forgotten, he would never have thought of trying to get it out of the stone, even for Kay, his foster brother. Skip a little bit here, setting the stage. 
Arthur took the sword, two-handed by its quillions. There was golden writing on the stone, but he did not stop to read it. The sword seemed to thrill under his touch as a harp thrills in response to its master's hand. He felt strange, as though he were on the point of learning some truth that he had forgotten before he was born. The thin winter sunlight was so piercing bright that he seemed to hear it. A high wind, a high white music in his blood. And then he draws the sword. So, this moment is always a little strange when you're hearing the story. Um, that Arthur just is in such a hurry that he grabs the only sword he can find uh, and runs back to Kay with it, right? So Sutcliffe does a little bit of work to make this make more sense. Um, and we see Merlin, disguised as the beggar, uh, intervene in this moment. He sort of casts a spell over the young uh, prince who doesn't know he's a prince. He makes him forget. So there's a forgetting happening in Arthur here that's important because it means he'll try something that's otherwise a little bit crazy. But along with the forgetting, there's this learning, almost like remembering a truth he'd forgotten before he was born. This idea is what you sometimes hear described called recollection. The idea that recollection in this sense is a a knowledge that you have without realizing it, and then something makes you remember. And there is a big discussion about whether we can ever truly learn anything or only be reminded of it, of something we used to know. And there's no way to really prove this one way or the other. It's more of a kind of philosophical problem. It's a, it's a thought problem. How do we learn things? Okay. No. You can probably think of lots of examples of times when you learn something, but when you really get it, when that moment clicks, it's almost like you're remembering it. It's almost like it's a knowledge that you had, just had to realize that you had it. So there's this weird kind of on the one hand, Arthur's forgetting. On the other hand, when he touches the sword, there's this kind of power that he feels. It's compared to music, like a harp. It's compared to learning. And again, compared to music in his blood. Um, I think, like Merlin, has these different layers to him. We can see here that Arthur does too. What he's remembering, of course, is who he really is. His identity as the prince, the rightful king now of the island. So, that's the sword and the stone, of course. But it's interesting to me that, you know, kind of like the two towers, you know, people argue over which two towers are we talking about? Um, I think the title of this book really invites us to think, which sword? The sword. Okay. Well, there's the sword and the stone. This is the sword, the identity sword. This is proving who Arthur is, the rightful king. Okay. But then there's this other sword, sword from the lake, the sword that he's going to use for most of his career beyond just the beginnings here. And the sword that um, represents his connection with this other kind of magical world, the world of fairy in the sense of uh, beings older, wiser, right? And again, beyond our human notions, good and evil. Um, he has a connection to them too. So the circle, I think, is a little easier to make sense of. Um, but I, I think we need to be wondering about those swords here. Uh, all right, so let's look at the young Arthur here. 
we've got the circle put together um, and we've got the first real example here I think of a great joust battle um, so King Pelinor another king running around right there's all these other kings running around Arthur has got to bring into line and uh, the lady wants vengeance because her her master has been killed uh, and Arthur wants to go himself um, but this boy Grifflet speaks up and claims the right to go um, so Sir Grifflet this young kind of alter ego for Arthur right goes after King Pelinor and uh, he whacks the shield that's hanging there King Pelinor comes out and asks why I smote you down my shield sorry this is on page 38 Grifflet answers for that I would joust with you formal right uh, mode of address challenge. And Grifflet's no match for Pelinor, right? He's just a kid, but he insists. And so Pelinor obliges. Um, Pelinor took his spear and shield and mounted his horse. They drew apart the proper distance and turning, set their spears in rest and rode full tilt upon each other. Grifflet took King Pelinor in mid-shield, shattered it to pieces. Pelinor's point went clean through Grifflet's shield and deep into his left flank, and there broke off short, the point lodging in his body, and horse and rider were brought crashing down. Doesn't go well for Grifflet. Does not go well for Grifflet. So, we're told that the tournaments are the really dangerous one. Um, but the joust, you know, people die in jousting too. Um, and what this is, I think, showing us is that this is a, a society where strength, physical strength, matters a lot, of course, right? Um, but just as much, maybe, is courage. Right? Grifflet is not a terribly strong warrior. Not even really a knight uh, until King Arthur allows him to go on this this joust. Um, but he is very brave. Right, um, his courage is undaunted. Uh, he does not take no for an answer, and you can say a lot about um, how messed up this old medieval society is. But that sense of courage in the face of danger is at least a little bit admirable, I think. Um, certainly the way that Rosemary Sutcliffe is presenting this in line with her sources, she's making this something that we can really feel the importance of it. Uh, we can really put ourselves in the story and... Uh, when that spear goes in, you really feel that, I think. Um, and, and the sadness of Arthur when he comes upon his, his freshly made knight. Um, so then Arthur challenges Pelinor, uh, gets a little bit further, deals a bit of damage uh, to Pelinor, but Pelinor bears him down, right? And Arthur would rather die then yield. The problem is, again, Pelinor doesn't know who he's fighting. And so Merlin has to swoop in one more time here. If you slay this man, you slay all hope for Britain, he says. He is Arthur the High King. So, uh, strength, courage, in very high regard here, um, knowledge, right? Even knowing who it is you're fighting, not so important. Um, and certainly, uh, 
lots of um, lots of courtesy, right? Saying the right things and going about things the right way. Um, that all matters a lot. Um, but even knights can lose their cool, right? Um, Pelinor's about to kill this young man. Um, and we see this much more so in the first real quest that we get, the first big quest of the round table. Um, Pelinor participates in it. Gawain also. Uh, and is it Lamarek who's the third? Yeah, I think it's Lamarek who's the third one. So it's this quest where the three knights go in different directions, chasing after three different uh, sort of components. Okay. Um, and in this quest, things go kind of sideways, uh, especially for Gawain, who really loses his temper and goes to kill his opponent, and the lady jumps in the way, right? Um, so if we go back a bit, around page 52, we have some important prophecies about the round table. Percival, when he shows up, is going to be the sign that the end is near. Um, but then, this is something that keeps on happening to King Arthur. Um, just when we're about to sort of figure out some mystery, or have dinner, or whatever it might be, right? the mystery of the Holy Grail is is just teased here for a moment. Um, then this deer, this heart, flies in after it, a, a hunting dog, a bratchet, the black hounds, and um, and then a, a knight, uh, or sorry, no, a, a horse and a, a lady comes in after it, um, a maiden on a white palfrey. So the knight carries away the, the dog. Um, the lady wants the, uh, the dog back. And Arthur looks at Merlin like he doesn't know what to do exactly. Um, but Merlin says, send your knights after them and tells them who to send. Um, the important thing here seems to be that when strange things happen, when mysteries are before us, we can take some kind of action about it. We can go after and try to set things right. Um, again, we don't know the full story. We don't have full knowledge of who the lady is, who the knight is, why they're chasing each other around. Right? We don't really need to know exactly. Because Merlin uh, has knowledge about the future. right? He can't control it, but he does. And so in some way, in these stories, Things are fated. There's a fate, kind of like Beowulf talks about. Um, but again, we can't know fully, but we are involved in. We're connected. Um, so the upshot of this first quest is that um, Gawain shows by his kind of wild actions. Um, the importance of taking care of of, of ladies, right? taking a special care of damsels. She always spells it damosel, like a D-A-M-O-S-E-L. So I don't know if we're supposed to pronounce that differently somehow. Um, but this whole idea of chivalry, right? The way that strong, brave warriors are supposed to act, particularly when they're dealing with people who aren't armed, who aren't able to fight back. Right? And so this is something that Arthur and the Round Table are meant to uphold, right? to not just allow random kings to run around causing mayhem, right? random knights, um, but to certain enforce certain rules in the kingdom. So again, we have this idea, I think, of the importance of jousting, tournaments, 
as games, as um, ways to contain this dangerous strength, this lack of, of perfect knowledge, this foolhardy courage, you know, at times really downright stupid courage. We need a way to keep that in check. And so the way is this, this game called jousting, this thing called a tournament, and now this concept of chivalry, right? Of um, being courteous to ladies, especially, and also trying to follow the rules when you're facing off against another knight um, in battle. Again, we don't fully know how Merlin knows that this is the right thing to do, but that's what he says. And we certainly don't know much about this mystery of the Holy Grail. So there is there is a higher level here uh, in terms of uh, what rules we're following. Um, and, and that has a religious aspect, right? The Holy Grail. We don't know much about that at this stage. Um, so we'll have to just keep an eye out for that as we go along. And that, that's what our book about um, uh, the light. Let me get this title correct here. I think it's the light in the forest that we'll be looking at next time. Ah, the light beyond the forest will be our, our book for next time. Um, and that deals with the Holy Grail. All right, so Arthur Merlin. All right, and we've been mentioning a few times around table, circle, and the ladies. Uh, we get introduced to Guinevere. Um, she is the one that Arthur sets his sights on. And Marilyn asks, you know, are you sure about this? That's, uh, that's, you could have any woman, and that's the one that Arthur wants. But then there's also, of course, besides Guinevere, there's Morgan Le Fay. Uh, Arthur's sister, who dabbles in magic, um, and who's always causing trouble. So, kind of inexplicably, again, Arthur always kind of trusts Morgan. Um, <laughs> is this here? This is on 77, 78. Alas. All this is the doing of my sister, Morgan. Again and again, Merlin warned me against telling me what she was and what she would seek to do, but still I trusted her and delighted to have her about my court. But never again, said Arthur in a weeping voice. Never again. So he's just been tricked into killing uh, another knight. We've been fighting uh, without knowing who each other is, uh, like you do. Um, and she's, she's, was hoping to get Arthur killed, right? Um, but instead he kills her dear, uh, sweetheart, Sir Acalon. Now, um, her plot's not fully explained. Um, she seems to be causing trouble just for the, the sake of it. Um, I think if we know a little bit more of the background here, uh, what Morgan is up to and, and why she is tricking, deceiving Arthur. Um, it probably has to do, again, with some family history that's in the background here. Um, but also, maybe she is not lying here when she says, um, Nay, but the fiends of hell tempted me. It was their doing, not mine. And see, the madness has passed from me. Right. The queen swears that she'll never do this again. Right. Then Morgan Le Fay's heart almost broke within her, for she had indeed loved Sir Accalon in her fashion, and it was more than her hopes of usurping the crown of Britain that lay dead upon his bier. But she hid her grief for her own safety. Right. So, she does have some real emotions here. And she might really have been tempted by some powers 
again, not the Holy Grail this time, but sort of the opposite, right? Um, dark powers, powers beyond her control. Um, and the connection between magic and spirits and things like that is really unclear in these stories. Um, but she is certainly feeling some amount of, uh, of remorse, of sorrow for what she's done here. Um, it doesn't stop her from stealing the scabbard, right? And, and making Arthur vulnerable, because as long as he had the scabbard, he was invincible. Couldn't lose blood, but now he can. Um, so I think this is a sign, again, Arthur isn't perfect. Uh, we know this from very early on. Um, there's a whole family story there. Uh, and, of course, his doom in the form of his son, Mordred. We're going to learn more about that um, in the third book, I suppose. Um, that's there from the beginning. Uh, but uh, these characters, even the evil ones, right? even Morgan Le Fay, even the good ones like Arthur, they have a kind of uh, passionate, emotional nature to them. They, they really feel strongly. Uh, in a way that I kind of think people today, me, I'll speak for myself, um, my emotions are usually pretty moderate, you know? Uh, I don't usually have big swings of happiness and sadness. Um, but this is all taking place in a world where those emotions are big, right? And so that's one other thing I think that we should be getting from this story. One other thing that, that Rosemary Sutcliffe does a really nice job of conveying um, is that, that force of, of beauty and of danger, of um, great joy, great sadness, great sorrow, great grief, right? All of these kind of big emotions. So, uh, something you don't always see in, in modern stories or in modern life, really, right? We're, we're too comfortable now. Um, but you get it in, in these, in these legends. All right. Well, that's Morgan. There's just a couple other knights that I wanted to just touch on here. Um, so the rest of the book, and I really think the beginning of this book is the strongest part for me, at least part I enjoy most stuff with Merlin and Arthur and some of these early jousts and quests and things because as the story goes on it's getting a lot of kind of repetition right and that's not a bad thing if you like these kind of stories but we kind of get little stories of individual nights for the rest of the book um, and so i wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on all of that but a few of them are super important right we mentioned gawain and the gawain stories are super interesting uh, that first quest of the ground table where you get this concept of chivalry from um, Gawain and the Green Knight right, where we see his uh, his courage his faithfulness um, not perfect but, but he's young as the, as the Green Knight says and he loves life and then we see Gawain and the loathly lady the loathly, the ugly lady um, another great story. Um, so Gawain gets a lot of time on stage here. Uh, in a way, again, he sort of stands in for Arthur after a while. He takes on quests that Arthur wants to do, but he really can't because he's, you know, the king. He can't be put in danger. Um, but then there's also Lancelot. And Lancelot, in another way, is a kind of alter ego because he's the best of the knights, right? He's what Arthur really should be if he's the high king. Um, in this society, that should mean he's the, the great warrior as well. And Arthur isn't necessarily the greatest warrior. Actually, Lancelot is uh, pretty much unbeatable. Um, and he enters the story here. Uh, he's brought to the court. Um, he also has a connection with the land. 
of the Lady of the Lake, and um, he uh, also, importantly, has a connection with Guinevere. So, let's see, uh, yeah, on the, f yeah, here we go, in the middle of page 88, we have this passage um, where there's jealousy about Lancelot, and so people think that's the reason Lancelot set off so soon on his first quest, they thought he went to prove himself, to quiet the muttering. Lancelot let them think it, but he had another reason. On the first evening, after his cousin Lionel had been made at night also, when supper was over in the great hall, it's not all that late, right, because supper happens early, when the king and Sir Gawain were playing chess, he fell without knowing it to watching the queen as she sat with the torchlight meshed in her dark hair, listening with her chin cupped in her hand to an old song the king's harper was singing. So the reason he goes on the quests right away and all the time is always on quests. Maybe part of the reason he's such a great knight because he gets all this practice um, is that he needs to be away from Guinevere. He feels another kind of danger here, right? And it takes another kind of strength for him to resist this temptation to fall in love with the queen. Um, and so there's a uh, a sense again that this is fate, right? This is inescapable. This is going to happen, and Merlin seems to know this. Um, but in a way, that doesn't really matter, right? Because Lancelot is trying his best. Again, nobody in this story is perfect, with maybe one exception. Um, when we get there, uh, we'll talk about him. But but Lancelot is truly great in many ways, and he is fighting against this temptation that he knows is wrong. It proves to be strong, stronger than him. But he does his best. Um, and again, there's a little bit of the sense of powers beyond human control here, um, magical powers, spiritual powers, right? Um, the power of fate in, in that way is, uh, is very comprehensible, right? If it's something like the feeling of falling in love, right? Or the feeling of remembering who you really are, right? The way Arthur felt when he pulled the sword, then, then maybe there is a way we can understand these powers that are greater than human beings, uh, even super strong ones, even super chivalrous ones, right? like we have in these stories. Uh, because again, we do experience something like that. Maybe not all that often. All right. So Lancelot uh, is pretty important, of course, um, not just for his abilities in battle, but also, again, because of his family, his connections. Um, so we see uh, Lancelot is tricked, and he does uh, think that he's betraying the king with Guinevere. Turns out that it's a, a spell that's cast um, by a, a lady called Elaine, who's uh, madly, deeply in love with Lancelot. Um, and so she is the one who's going to have the, the te closest to perfect knight there ever was. That's um, Galahad, who we'll see later. Um, Lancelot goes a little bit crazy as a result uh, of falling short. Um, and again, uh, there is this suggestion that he's not going to be able to stay away from Guinevere forever. Um, but the last night here, uh, so we'll skip over some of the others like Tristan and uh, uh, Beaumains and uh, Geraint or Geraint. 
Uh, let's skip up to the last one, Percival. So Percival is, again, he's the one who's going to be the, uh, the last to show up before the Holy Grail, the whole Holy Grail thing. Um, and so he does. Um, he's been raised out in the wild, away from knights in armor and ladies at court and all this stuff. Um, he is nevertheless drawn to uh, this dream he has. The dream of shining men and great horses, my father with a golden circlet on his head. Right. Um, the problem is that he, uh, he too, is, is fated to be a warrior. Right. So his mother can't keep him away forever. He finds his way to Camelot. He takes a quest um, to go and recover a, a, a cup, a golden cup. As you can see, right, the golden cup is kind of a an echo, right? A a foreshadowing of the Holy Grail itself, just the way that Percival is foreshadowing Galahad, who's on his way. Um, and by the end of this this chapter with Percival, uh we see that um, Arthur and the others, they're remembering at this point. It's been a while, but they're still remembering, remembering Merlin and his prophecies. And he says, um, it will not be the same, never the same again after they go after the Holy Grail. We shall have done all that is in us to do for Britain, for the kingdom of Logres, for all that we have fought and built for and tried to make secure. We shall have served our purpose, made a shining time between the dark and the dark. Merlin said it would be as though all things drew on to the golden glory of the sunset, but then it will all be over. Lancelot said, we, have, we shall have made such a blaze that men will remember us on the other side of the dark. So there's this creepy feeling that you get from this, right? They know that this attempt to form a better society is doomed, right? But they're going to do their best anyway. And again, why? Because of memory. Because something, even though they won't succeed, something will live on. Something will live on, and people will remember it. When he says men, we would understand that to mean all people, right? When they're talking about the dark, we can think of the dark ages, right? The medieval period itself, um, that history. Um, but there are other dark times since then. Terrible, terrible times. Uh, and what lasts, what carries on beyond those, uh, our stories, right? Our, our sense of uh, who we are, what we're trying to do, um, feelings of uh, these kind of emotions, uh, love and bravery and all, all that the good side of chivalry should represent for us. These are really pretty universal uh, throughout all stories. Um, so like I say, I'm not the biggest King Arthur fan. I don't necessarily love all the jousting and tournaments and stuff over and over again. Uh, even the quests, I, I don't know. Um, but I really love parts uh, in, in this book, parts that deal with Merlin and Arthur um, and the way that Rosemary Sutcliffe and it brings all this back together at the end of this book. Does a nice job of setting us up for the sequel, right? So, for next time, 
we should be looking up the light beyond the forest. The quest for the Holy Grail is the subtitle there. Um, this is the second in the series and is going to be our focus for next month. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. Uh, this has been Signum Academy on Twitch. If you want to see some of our other programs, check out our website. We've got some exciting stuff coming up. Uh, so get in touch with us on there. Let us know if you have any questions, comments. Um, it's getting dark here. The sun has set, at least behind the clouds. It's all snowy. Uh, it's all cold. Um, but we'll carry on. Uh, carry on fighting and um, persevering. Um, thanks again, and enjoy your reading uh, of The Light Beyond the Forest by Rosemary Sutcliffe for next time.